Our scripture today is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And this is possibly a different translation from what you've heard before. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God hath made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God indeed said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Then the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not die at all, but God doeth Noah, that when ye shall eat thereof, your ears shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and you will. So the woman, seeing that the tree was good for meat, and that it was pleasant to the ears, and a tree to be desired to get knowledge, took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave you also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Then the ears of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig tree leaves together, and made themselves breeches. This is the reading of God's word. Thank you, thank you, Beth, for a lovely reading. I knew why to pick you as our reading uh, reader of a biblical uh, text, uh, especially of this one. Uh, I know your love for English and also New English, but also the Old English. And uh, dear friends, I will not be preaching that much about the biblical text which we just heard or only tangentially or just touching it. Uh, but I had a reason why I picked this particular biblical passage. And dear friends, I don't know whether you can see it. This is the Bible from which Beth read to us. Of course, she had a sheet of paper, not, not this, this Bible is right now with me. Although originally that was almost like uh, in a plan to have that Bible in the hand of the, that person. But then I would not be able to have it here in my living room. So this is the Bible from which Beth read to us and transliteration of that text. Uh, Genesis chapter three will be right here. These are introductory parts, and soon we are in Genesis, and Genesis chapter 3 will be somewhere, this is 7, Genesis chapter 3 will be right here. This is the text. It's the oldest Bible in our church library, and it is also our direct link with the Reformation, English Reformation. This particular volume is from 1600 exactly, printed in London. But originally this translation was made before 1560 and was published in that year in Geneva. And I'll be talking about it more. But here I need to make a congratulation because in our Friday message, we played a game. I showed the frontispiece of that Bible and asked uh, what kind of Bible is it? What translation? And Edith Mutindi Kavu from Mombasa knew first and responded and said, that is Genevan Bible or Geneva Bible. 
And then shortly afterwards, Susan Mathias uh, also sent me an email. So congratulations, thank you. We don't have any rewards. Maybe when I am back, I'll have some special cookies for you. Uh, I don't know how to do it with sending anything to Mombasa. Uh, I have hard difficulties in sending small gifts even to Europe these days. But I knew about that keen interest in English and old English. And so it is marvelous to have her read this uh, ancient, it's not ancient, medieval translation. This translation, of course, considering the dates, predates Shakespeare and King James Version by more than half a century. This was a biblical translation of English and the New England Puritans, Calvinists. And when King James Version finally appeared, these people uh, who were behind this translation and then continued their faith in England, as well as here behind the ocean uh, in America, sort of distrusted it for reasons which I will explain later. I ask for this specific passage because it gave this Bible its nickname. Imagine the Bible had its nickname, such a popular Bible it was. And its nickname was the Breaches Bible. Because at the end of that reading, we heard that humans, made themselves out of leaves, breaches. That was a unique translation. Chagura or chagurot in plural, uh, in Hebrew simply means loincloth, girdle, belt, anything be below the waist. And it can be also the same root can be used, for instance, for a short dagger, which was probably worn there. And uh, there was clearly a short period in medieval English when breeches meant underwear before it actually became a name for a knee length trousers worn with stockings or high boots for riding horses. But it was a short and strange enough period when breaches were underwear, to generate this nickname. It was peculiar and interesting, and so that was why it gave that. Not only popularity of the translation, but also this peculiar way. But also another reason besides that there was this short period when breaches were underwear, uh, also it tells us something about the origin of this translation. It was translated in exile. British reformers and theologians escaped from England and Scotland. John Knox, by the way, was in Geneva at that time as well. They escaped from there, from Great Britain, escaping English Bloody Mary of Tudor. Many went to Geneva uh, for very good reason. Bloody Mary was bloody and persecuted the Protestants. And they had a good reason for escaping that religious perse persecution. William Tyndale, their predecessor in translating the Bible into English, also did it in European exile, but even his European exile, most likely in Hamburg, did not work well for him. A double agent sent by English clergy and king found him and he was burned on stake in 1536, just a few years before they started this particular translation. Translating the Bible was a capital crime in medieval times. 
at least at the beginning. So they had good reason for working from a safe exile, deeply rooted in our reform faith is this experience with being refugees and being in exile. And it influences our worldview and how our faith is oriented in this world. And also not in an easy and a simple way, but our reform tradition was a source of our modern, many modern freedoms. Freedom to dissent, to oppose the government or a monarch especially. Freedom of conscience, freedom of faith, freedom to think, speak and publish for yourself. Exile was an hardship, but it also led to this unbinding of freedom among those who escaped. And this Bible is a testament to it, and a reason why English-speaking Calvinists continued reading it long after King James Version was published in more contemporary language and spelling. I know that it might sound strange to American Christians, but English-speaking Calvinists, Puritans, and Scottish Church did not embrace and trust King James Version, definitely not in early stages. They did not like the royal patronage, and rightly so. There were documented instances when King James Version bent over backwards to please or at least not offend the royal feelings. The Bible is profoundly anti-monarchical against royalty that cannot be changed. But King James Version translators at least tried. Nothing like that could be said about the Genevan Bible, product of exile and viciously independent. The royal patronage of the King James Version made it into a tool of, indirectly, a tool of fundamentalism, and I would even claim a textual idolatry. Why and how? Because King James Version eliminated critical apparatus in the Bible. Let me show you. There are marginal nodes. The text is in the middle in two columns. And there are marginal nodes on one margin and on the other side as well. And these are marginal nodes with cross references, textual comments showing a broader context of what is being translated in the Bible itself. On a bulletin cover, you have that translation of the Genesis 3, 1 through 7. And on a side, in that narrower column, you have actually those uh, marginal notes explaining or putting the, that particular passage into the context. And it is interesting. Of course, it's dated. It's given that they used the scholarship they had available at that time. But it was a study Bible. King James personally labeled these cross-references and textual comments as seditious, subversive, with disdain for hierarchy and royalty. That, those were his words. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to have a new translation without these notes. Well, but 
you know, that is the Bible. <laughs> if you really read it and understand and understand the context which these notes were supposed to provide, then you end up with this message. And that was not to liking of King James. But without critical apparatus for study, Bible, the biblical text became just into a bare bones, absolute artifact, an idol, not for study, but idolized, quoted out of context. When you know this background, isn't then King James Version status, especially in American uh, Christianity, and its lore about the legends, about its inspiration and so on, somehow sadly funny. For us here, I would like to bring and make few points. First of all, Bible, when taken seriously and studied diligently, is dangerous, is subversive, revolutionary book, especially when comprehended, not an artifact of idolatry. It has been so in Reformation time, and I believe it remains until now. Secondly, it deserves to be read and studied in the context and with a deepening understanding. Of course, some of those comments and textual references and so on, as I mentioned, are dated. But there are times when I refer to them as well. They might be hundreds of years old, but sometimes there are very interesting and deep insights until now. We now know more from archeology span and textual criticism and extra biblical texts and discovered other gospels and so on. But this is a foundation upon which the modern scholarship can build. It was a pity to eliminate that. I know that King James Version later became also and started to be printed as a study Bible and trying to replace some of these comments and textual notes, but that came much later. There is a good reason to be on guard that's the third point. There is a good reason to be on guard against governmental interference in religion or consciousness. And here I would like to mention just thing about what is happening right now in our society with Supreme Court taking more and more the religious positions and trying to force feed them to society. Our reformers, reformers in our history will be up in arms and you are justified of doing it as well. Joining with humanists and even secularists and atheists in our society in that respect, our fight is the same. Fighting for the freedom of faith, freedom of conscience, freedom to dissent, freedom to be who we are called to be individually and collectively, but without being forced by the law, by courts, or by the government. And finally, exile might be hard. Living in a foreign country, away from home, is not an easy task. And I am not in exile, but I live in a different country than I was born, 
and the language of which I learn from my mother. Minus persecution, I came free and on my own volition or being called to come. But there is something even deeper when that is forced on people, when they need to go to save their lives, when they are refugees, when they are in exile. It is tough, even tougher than what I described about my own life. There is a DNA of our faith tradition of descent, exile, and refugees, and fighting for them because we know how it feels. There is this weak spot for it in our outreach. But also, as a society, I would like to mention that for all of us, after COVID, after pandemic, I hear people saying it feels like still like exile. We escaped from one world and we don't feel like at home in this new world. Well, it might be the case. To preserve life, we left certain things behind and escaped and found different ways. Our Reformation faith and our traditions can help us to process and can help us to recognize that it can be also liberating. The rest of the people, for the rest of the people around us, exile, when thoughtfully and diligently approached, can lead to liberation and achievements. It can lead to a true gems like this Geneva Bible, Breaches Bible so much advanced and so much free that it needed to be replaced but by more reactionary Bible in half a century later and is to some degree replaced until now. And in my own tradition, why I was so in love with this breaches Bible is that here is the Czech version from roughly the same time. This actually predates this printing of Genevan Bible. This is from the 15, 1587. Bible not printed in exile, but almost in exile because it was printed in hiding. Again, translating and printing Bible was dangerous. And I think that if it is not dangerous now, then we should take a note of it. Faith in the world is dangerous. And we need to take it and take that challenge and fight against injustice and for freedom of faith expression and religion for ourselves and the people around us. That is the heritage of our Reformation. <laughs>